Good afternoon and welcome to the first show of 2021 for the Global Report. I'm your host, Lily. We have back with us today, Mr. Steve O'Kun, a former official in the Clinton administration and current advisor at McClarty. Welcome back, Steve. Thank you for having me back. Now, Steve, the last time we chatted, we were still discussing the prospects of the U.S. presidential election. And now we have Biden poised to step into the presidency next week. Yes, I mean, it is uh, certainly in circumstances no one ever uh, foresaw this uh, attack on the Capitol uh, led and, and fueled by Donald Trump is going to change everything. Um, it, it's going to change not only domestic politics in the U.S., it's going to have a, a large impact on um, U.S. foreign policy, what Biden had wanted to do and now what Biden can do going forward. Well, you know, that's exactly what I want to get your take on today is American policy under, uh, under Biden. Uh, we know that after four years of Trump, Biden is inheriting a, a presidency, like you just said, like no other. So for one thing, the image, the values, the influence of U.S. leadership abroad have been severely corroded. And I know Washington's focus is probably not going to be on Europe, but let's start with Europe. During Trump time, he slapped a bunch of tariffs on the continent. Do you see Biden reversing some of those tariffs? Yeah, I look, I mean, Biden is going to take a fundamentally different approach uh, in, in two ways. First, he's not going to attack our allies. Uh, so look, there are trade tensions um, when it comes to, to subsidies between the U.S. and the EU, between the U.S. and, and, and Canada, India, uh, other allies. But but how Trump has gone about addressing those is completely wrong. Uh, it was counterproductive. And certainly, um, they are going to be addressed very differently uh, under a Biden administration when it comes to working with our allies globally. Uh, he is also going to take a fundamentally different approach um, when it comes to a, a multilateral approach to foreign policy as opposed to the unilateral approach. So it is going to be a sea change, and, and that change will occur faster uh, in Europe than it will occur in Asia because of the longstanding relationship and because, uh, generally speaking, the countries are and should be aligned on foreign policy and trade policy, although with some significant differences. Now, just to hold you to my first question, because I'm really curious how he's going to address this. It's kind of delicate because on the one hand, he has to keep in mind that it's the Rust Belt states like Michigan, like Pennsylvania that helped to secure his election win. And on the other hand, I don't think this escalation of tariffs with Europe is going to go very far. So how do you think he's going to resolve these tariff issues with Europe? Is he going to reverse some of those tariffs? Well, I, if, for sure, he's going to reverse some of them. But the question is, it's a negotiation. Um, and I think we need to keep in mind that, that while Donald Trump was a disaster as a president from a foreign policy perspective, it doesn't mean that every action he took didn't have some basis uh, or justification under, under U.S. law. There are subsidies uh, that take place um, in Europe that need to be addressed. There is some market opening in Europe that needs to be addressed. But the way to do that is not through unilateral tariffs. It is, it is to negotiate um, an agreement. And I think you're going to see that negotiation. Look, the issue is the bandwidth of, uh, of, of the U.S. government is, is limited um, by the amount of resources it has internally. And you have so many pressing matters across the entire world. It's hard to say, well, are we going to start negotiating with Europe first or is it going to be China? Uh, is it going to be back to the WTO? All of these things need to be addressed. So I, I think hard to say what's going to come first, but the approach is going to be different. The ultimate outcome, you can see generally where we're headed with Europe. Okay, fair enough. Now let's, uh, let's move on to defense and security. Um, I know that uh, European allies have been debating an independent security path. So on one hand, we have France, who's advocating for strategic autonomy while defrosting relations with Moscow. In the middle, we've got Germany, who's saying, no, 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 don't push the United States away. And then we've got the Baltic states. We've got Poland, who see no alternative to U.S. military presence. What can Biden administration expect from NATO and vice versa? Well, and I think this ties into a bit of more, what are the Europeans' expectations of the United States? Does Europe believe, and, and this is a global question, is the U.S. back um, to its, its pre-Trump approach uh, to foreign policy? Or is the U.S. going to have a chance four years from now to return to Donald Trump's version of America first, 
um, which is unilateral and it's isolationist. And if the European allies do not believe that after that after one term of Biden, we could come back to, to President Trump or a Trump-like foreign policy, they are going to have to pursue some more of, of an independent course. And so you're going to see what happens in, in Washington when it comes to handling the insurrection on January 6th have a large impact on how allies and competitors view the United States, not just for the Biden administration, but beyond the Biden administration. All right. Well, let's move on to Middle East, uh, the messy can of worms. Uh, maybe we can start with Iran. I know that uh, the incoming Secretary of State Blinken said that Biden's going to be doing less, not more in the Middle East. But we have heard this kind of vocal pledges many times in the past about pulling back from Middle East. So looking at Iran, do you think Biden's going to go back to the nuclear deal? Well, I mean, you have to presume he's going to, to take a multilateral approach, unlike the Trump administration. It was the Obama-Biden administration that negotiated the nuclear deal. Um, the presumption is that that approach isn't going to change. You have to ask yourself, what is Iran going to do? Um, because that is going to dictate a lot of it. But you should see a multilateral approach to bringing Iran into constraints as opposed to trying to use sanctions against Iran and sanctions against your own allies to force Iranian behavior to change, which has never worked. So I think it's safe to say you're going to see that same multilateral approach from the Obama administration into the Biden administration. It's the multilateral approach of Republicans and Democrats before, before the Trump administration. So sure, that, that should revert back to that form, but will there be a deal? When would there be a deal? What would be in the deal? What is Iran going to do? All of that is going to take a lot of time. Do you think America is going to come up with new terms for Iran to suck up before they are willing to go back to the table? Uh, it, it's certainly possible, depending on what Iran has done since the agreement has been broken. So, I mean, I think that's the type of thing you have to say that this administration, this incoming administration, is going to go back to a fact-based <laughs> negotiation and then letting the facts take you where you need to go on, on any agreement with sufficient constraints. Um, so that's what we're going to have to watch over the next coming you know, year or so when it comes to the Iran deal. You know, just to tackle your earlier question about what you think Iran is going to do, you know, I, I think Rouhani is a reformist. I see him interacting and engaging U.S. diplomatically, but the group of people I'm watching is, the, um, you know, those religious conservatives because they are in an internal struggle with Rouhani. So I think that is the group of people that has the potential to prevent the next deal from happening. And that, you know, and, 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 and that's the point. I think every, all the questions are, what's Biden going to do on Iran? What's Biden going to do on China? What's Biden going to do uh, on Europe? The question is, as much, if not more, what is she going to do in China? What are, what, what's what's going to happen politically uh, in, in Iran? What's going to happen politically in Germany and France and and, and, and the others. So re that is a, 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 the question that you have to ask in addition to what is the Biden approach going to be. Um, and until you can understand that's part of the equation, you really can't predict what's going to happen. You would hope that a Biden administration and a willingness to come back to a traditional multilateral foreign policy is going to give room to the reform reformers, if you can say that, the reformers in Iran, um, to, to have more authority. But Iranian politics is going to play out very differently uh, uh, in, in, beyond what's going to happen in D.C. Okay, what about Saudi Arabia? Because this is a region that, you know, Biden can actually do more, do less of. I want to call attention to the Saudi-led war in Yemen. I mean, despite the horrendous humanitarian cost of the Saudi-led war in Yemen, U.S. has continued to be the main supplier of bombs to Saudi Arabia. So, I know under Trump, ties were very cozy with Saudi, but do you see Biden resetting these relations with Saudi, taking a second look at their defense ties, and you know maybe instead of turning a blind eye and keep up with the lucrative arms sales, do something with Saudi? Again, it is also, will Saudi see this as, as, a, as a reason to change as well? Is there going to be an opening um, for them to, to take the steps that they need to take internally and in terms of, of, of the, 
you know, the, the, the wars that are occurring, the battles, if not outright wars that are occurring uh, across, you know, the Middle East. It's only when, when, when the, um, uh, you know, the, the Trump administration is on the way out the door that they start taking uh, actions, different actions in, in Yemen. And yet, it, it, is that going to lead to even more of a humanitarian crisis? So the, they're, they're, the Biden administration has so much on its plate to deal with. Um, and and on, and it, you can't ignore what's happening in, in, in the U.S. domestically right now as to how much they can do all at once and what priorities they are going to take. Yeah, um, well, we're going to touch on the domestic issues just a little bit later. Well, let's do a pivot to Asia because I know this is going to be a consequential part of the world for decades to come. Um, but unlike Obama time, I think if... Biden would choose to focus his efforts here in Asia. Like you said, you know, U.S. is more constrained financially. That would mean that he has to scale back U.S. in other theaters like Europe and Middle East. So is he prepared to do that? Well, again, there, there's what are you going to do in terms of a multilateral approach and what are you going to do in terms of, of a trade approach? I mean, I think if you look at where the U.S. is today, is to where it was before Donald Trump came into office. Okay, from a from a trade and economic perspective, what has occurred, right? You you've got the the TPP goes forward without the U.S. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement of 15 countries, including China, Japan, ASEAN, and Australia, comes together without the U.S. You have the EU and China now negotiating a trade deal without the U.S. The U.S. is out in the cold. It is much worse off today, economically, than it was four years ago. It's no better, if not worse, when it comes to China, because what has occurred there, right? All of the unfair trade practices that China had been engaging in that led up to the tariffs that Donald Trump has opposed are still uh, in play. And China's economy continues to grow. So we've gotten nowhere uh, with China. And then if you want to throw in national security, no progress, or we've gone backwards on, on North Korea, we've gone backwards in the South China Sea. So what is it that the, the Biden administration can do to try and, and undo all of the damage that the Trump administration has done? It has to come back to a multilateral approach, working with allies to try and figure out how do you address all of these issues you have from an economic perspective and a security perspective that the Trump administration has only made worse over the past four years. Now, Steve, I keep hearing you say, I uh, mentioned this multilateral approach, and I concur with you on that. I'm just, I can't help but wonder, is that enough? Because, you know, Steve, when I look at Biden's foreign policy team, I see a lot of Obama alumni. And so on one hand, yes, they have the experience. But on the other hand, like you said, the world has changed. China has changed. U.S. has changed since 2016. So with this quasi-Obama team, are they simply going to dust off the old playbook? Or can we expect them? to come up with a stronger stomach for competition, because that is the reality of international relations. Okay, well, if you look at what, what's happened, let, let's go back to the, towards the end of the Obama administration. The longstanding US approach to China had been changing, right? You, you had a, a approach of, of uh, you know, let's accommodate and engage with China. And that started you know, in the 70s and certainly went through Republican and Democratic administrations through the China, uh, through the, the midpoint of the Obama administration. But then the realization came clear that the approach of accommodating and engaging with China was not going to produce any change um, in terms of China's unfair and anti-competitive behavior against foreign businesses, U.S. And, and others alike. And so that approach started to change under Obama. It changed most significantly with the TPP, where we said, let's take a multilateral approach and we are going to either force China, if they want to be part of the regional uh, trade architecture, to, to, to meet the, the rules that we all agree upon, or they can go and be outside of it. And that is the approach that was starting to work. And then it is the one that Donald Trump utterly destroyed um, with his withdrawal from the TPP and then everything he did for the four years thereafter. So yes, a multilateral approach can work, um, but it's going to be something that is going to take time. The second thing I think that has changed significantly in the past four years that the Biden administration is going to recognize is that the countries here are not waiting for US leadership. They are moving forward. They are not gonna be dictated to by the US and they're certainly not gonna be dictated to 
by China. It's why the TPP went forward without the US and without China. Um, and you're going to see a continued uh, agency within the members of ASEAN and Japan and Australia and, and hopefully India in, in moving forward. They want the U.S. to be part of that approach, but if the U.S. isn't going to be part of that approach, they'll move forward on their own. But with a Biden administration, the U.S. will be part of that approach. And it's why I think a multilateral framework in 2021 is going to be more impactful than the one that we had that really kind of started in 2015, 2016. Yeah, so when I look at US and China, I see that they are squabbling more than ever over, you know, many issues. They fight over trade, technology, espionage, COVID-19, China's policy on Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the, and the South China Sea. Um, but, um, you know, I'm just thinking some of these issues seems to be more bilateral than multilateral. Do you see Biden having the capability to bring China to the table and to seek some common ground? Because he's someone I see who's very capable of giving and taking and seeing things beyond zero sum. Well, I am going to disagree with, with, with the premise of the question in saying these are U.S.-China issues. These are not U.S.-China issues. These are issues for Japan. They're issues for Australia. They're issues for for. India, their issues for most of the countries, and should be, but for all of them, but certainly most of them in ASEAN. This is not a U.S.-China issue. This is where Trump failed miserably, and that people call this a U.S.-China, you know, trade war. Or it's Trump's trade war. It isn't. These are actions that that China has taken against many different actors, and so it's going to take many different actors to come together who are willing to do so to make those changes. Now you also have to keep in mind, China is critical. It is, it is the most critical market for, for most businesses in Asia. It's probably the second most critical market for, for many businesses of the United States and, and of, of the EU and, and otherwise. And so you have to engage with China. You have to find a way to engage with them um, in a way that leads to a, you know, use a Chinese phrase, you know, a win-win. And that is possible. China does need to make changes for its own domestic economy when it comes to IPR protection. It needs to make changes in terms of how it is going to handle technology. It doesn't want to be cut off. It doesn't want to have its technology cut off from the world. So there's incentives for both sides to cooperate. But there's also times where, where China needs to be confronted. And that's the balance that the, the Biden administration is going to have to find and it's going to be better to find that not on its own but working with 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 its partners well i will say this as an asean national i think we appreciate when when um, trump pushed back against china in the uh, south china sea um but looking at uh looking at asean i mean speaking again from asean national you know i i think we support u.s military presence in the region but we want, we're desirous of a lower temperature between US and China, because the last we want is to be the grass upon which the great power elephants trample on. So listening to you though, Steve, I have to raise this because, because until US resources get on par with this rhetoric, I think we are gonna remain skeptical in Southeast Asia because while China is doing more with more, US cannot be doing more with less. Well, and I mean, with a one, it's just not ASEAN that's skeptical about the United States. It's the whole world that's skeptical about the United States, especially after what happened uh, with the with the insurrection on the Capitol and, and Trump's uh, continuation so far in power, um, in so far having support uh, amongst uh, the majority of the Republican Party. Um, so you have that's a, a, a global issue. The other issue you have, um, though, is that I think ASEAN recognizes that it needs to chart its own course. It needs um, to move forward. It's why when the US left the TPP, everyone thought it was over, but it wasn't over. And it wasn't over because of leaders like, you know, Prime Minister Abe in, in Tokyo, but also leaders like, like Prime Minister Lee here uh, in Singapore. And so you're gonna continue to see where it can ASEAN lead as much as possible. And that's you, you saw that again with, with the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It is a mistake to call that a China-led uh, uh, agreement. It is at least as much led by, by ASEAN and by Japan as it was um, by China. So ASEAN recognizes it needs to chart its own course and it's whether, uh, or as much as it can, 
ideally with the United States as a partner, but if not, it's going to go forward as best it can on its own. Well, I think ASEAN is charting its own course. I mean, we're hedging our bets, whether the US like it or not. So on one hand, we are staying the good grace of the United States. On the other hand, we're keeping our options open for China and other US rivals. So I think we're doing just that. But do you think the US is going to come back to the TPP? It is a very difficult for the US to come back to the TPP, in part uh, for two reasons. One, um, under US law, uh, the authority to negotiate trade, new trade agreements expires uh, this summer, um, and it's doubtful that Congress is going to renew that. So that would mean that the U.S. would have to come back more or less to the existing TPP, which it won't because it doesn't have the change. It doesn't have the, the provisions in there, especially when it comes to labor, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to, to tax. Um, then now the question is, are the countries here just going to ac accept all of those changes from the U.S.? without any negotiation, that will be very difficult to do. So I don't see the US coming back to the TPP in year one or two of the Biden administration. You can see some sector specific deals. Maybe you can see a digital trade agreement that the US could join. So there are ways to, to, to come back to ASEAN, to come back to trade agreements without the TPP. And I think that's the more likely first step for the Biden administration, at least for its first two years. I think it's right for us to temper our expectations because U.S. has got its plate full domestically. You and I know that he has to hit the ground running to deal with the pandemic, to deal with the economy, to deal with the polarization, and I guess the side effects of impeachment of Trump, right? Well, I think that's actually the most important thing that, that isn't getting enough uh, attention right now. Um, there is going to be two issues coming forward. One is, uh, can you trust the United States after Biden leaves office as to whom the next president is going to be? Because the U.S. has a bad track record of living up to agreements. Um, it, it was, you know, it, it wasn't in Kyoto. It was in Paris and then it was out of Paris. It was in the Iran deal, it was out of the Iran deal. It was in TPP, it was out of TPP. And so it, why would you, if you're a foreign country, say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make all of these accommodations. I'm going to do what needs to be done on trade agreements like labor rights, like more environmental protections, but then to see the U.S. leave it. And then my domestic constituency is opposed to me. So I've paid a political price and gained nothing for it. So the U.S. is going to need to show that it is back on track from a, a bipartisan approach when it comes to trade and foreign policy. The only way it is going to do that is if Donald Trump is held liable for what happened when it came to his insurrection, that the Republican Party joins the Democratic Party in impeaching, convicting, and disqualifying him from office, and that you can then trust that even if Joe Biden's a one-term president, whoever replaces him on the Republican side is going to continue along the same lines as as, as Joe Biden did on a bipartisan foreign policy. Because if you don't, and if there is the threat that Donald Trump can run for office and win in 2024, why would you make any deal with the United States within the next four years? Well, Steve, I think you are making that statement on the assumption that once Trump is gone, Trumpism is gone. Well, he can't, Trumpism is going to be diminished if you have a Republican Party come together and say Trumpism is not welcome here. And if you say we are going to punish the people in the party who have been supporting him or at least disown them. And so splinter off the Trump part of the Republican Party, which right now is a large part of it, um, and then try and build back up that center right conservative Republican Party, which the country needs, then you can go forward. There, now, if Donald Trump has nothing happened to him and he starts running for president literally the, the January 21st, the day after the inauguration, it is going to be much worse. So the question is, where do our where do countries, competitors and allies alike see the United States going over the next four years? Because that is going to determine how much they're willing to trust a Biden administration. 
You know, Steve, it's been part and parcel of every American policy to spread its ideas of Western democracy far and wide. But after last week's riot, do you see America exercising a little bit more restraint and pulling back and saying, you know, maybe our way is not the best way after all and definitely not for everybody? Well, I think what you're going to see is that there's a significant wake up call in the United States that we have to address our issues. We have to address social media. We have to address hyper partisanship. We have to address voting rights. We have to address gerrymandering. And so I do think that there is a wake up call for enough people in the United States that there is going to be that we need to you know, walk the walk uh, in addition uh, to talking the talk. Um, will the Biden, you know, the Biden administration had talked about having a summit for democracy. Um, is that still going to occur? I don't know if it did. What does that mean? But, and I think this is the most important thing that I hope comes out of, out of January 6, is that you saw a president of the United States bring together and incite a mob to overthrow the government and it failed and the, the institutions held. And I hope that is the narrative that comes forward is that as flawed as the United States is, our system held, our system held, and that type of system is the one that works well, at least for, 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 for the United States. Yeah, I'm definitely not dismissing the tragedy that I think one good that came out of the riot is that it did open up the eyes of many of Trump's followers. Well, our time is up, Steve. Thank you so much for the generosity of your time and for contributing your highly valued expert input to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for having me again, Lily. And, and next time, hopefully I'll be in Hawaii for, for our, our next interview. Yeah, I hope so too. Well, that's Steve O'Kun, senior advisor at McClarty. Thank you.